Hello, everyone. My name is Amina. I'm the Director of Resources at the National Emerging Museum Professionals Network, and it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's Skillshare session. Um, just a bit of a background on this uh, series, uh, EMP Skillshare is all about knowledge sharing, building communities of practice, and creating speaking opportunities for EMPs, sometimes speaking about cheese. Uh, folks in the NEMPN community are invited to uh, submit proposals for webinars, demonstrations, or workshops focused on an area of their interest or expertise. And this EMP Skillshare presentation is generously sponsored by Drexel University's Art Administration and Museum Leadership Program. Uh, today's session is Centering the Frame, Tips and Tricks from Anatomy to Installation. And I'm so excited for today's session because as my walls can attest to, I have a lot to learn in this area. Um, our two lovely workshop facilitators are calling in from the Florida State University Museum of Fine Arts. I'll just introduce them both here before I hand it off to them. Uh, so first we have Annie Booth. Annie is the program coordinator at the FSU Museum of Fine Arts and a graduate of Florida State University with an MA in uh, Museum and Cultural Heritage Studies. She holds a certificate in museum education and visitor-centered exhibitions and oversees uh, MOFA's um, educational programming specializing in visitor engagement. She has extensive experience working with a wide range of partners and stakeholders and has presented her research at the Native American Art Studies Association Conference. So welcome, Anna, uh, Annie. Thank you so much for being here. And then we have uh, Kelly Hendrickson. And Kelly is the art preparator for the FSU Museum of Fine Arts, where she manages the shop and designs exhibitions. She holds a BFA in sculpture from George Mason University and an MFA in multimedia um, from Florida State University two fabulous, talented um, folks. This is so exciting. And uh, for the past 10 years, Kelly has worked as an art assistant, a handy person, and taught at art classes at community centers um, and the university level. She also maintains a modest studio practice and is one of the Tallahassee Zine Fest founding directors. So welcome, Kelly. Um, I'm now going to hand the floor over to both of them. Take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome, welcome. Thank you for that amazing introduction. Um, we just thought we would start with something that we start our programs with off at MOFA, which is our land acknowledgement. Um, and so we just wanted to just, you know, throw this out there. I don't know if your institutions has a land acknowledgement or that's part of your practice, but just something that we've committed to. So we acknowledge that the Florida State University Museum of Fine Arts is located on the land that is the ancestral and tradition, traditional territory of the Appalachian Nation, the Muscogee Creek Nation, the Mississippi Tribe of Florida, and the Seminole Tribe of Florida. With that, we recognize the impact of historical trauma and dispossession and ongoing systemic inequities. We acknowledge the, the relationships of care that these indigenous nations continue to maintain with this land. And through this acknowledgement, we celebrate their resilience and strength then and now and express our ongoing commitment to dismantle silence histories based on colonialism. So we just wanted to start that off with uh, our land acknowledgement, and then we'll go ahead and jump right into why you're all here, which is, of course, some framing. Yeah. So again, I'm Annie. I'm Kelly. <laughs> um, and we have a presentation for you, but we hope that you'll have lots of questions for us. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll be hoping to have it be a little bit more conversational. So anything that you... Oh, great. Another... Hello. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> um, so anything that you um, have that you're thinking about, no question is... Uh, too small. Yeah. And also, I love that. Feel free to share where you're coming from um, mm -hmm. or calling from in the chat. That's great. Yeah, we're going to try and keep the chat open. So um, uh, if I'm talking too fast, Annie can interrupt me and ask questions. Yes. <laughs> okay, so we're going to kick it off. Um, and just so you know, before we get started, we do have an activity at the end. Yeah. Um, so if you don't have the sheets uh, printed, and you have that avail available, to available to you, I think that there's a link that we can have in the chat um, and there it is you can <laughs> that was amazing like magic um, so you can print that you'll just need scissors and maybe a, something to write with um, and then the printed sheets yeah okay we'll get started all can, right can y'all see that okay yeah okay great but yeah this is the point where um, I would reiterate I would like it to you know we could we can keep this really conversational so if you do have a question pop it in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt me um, I can totally roll with that. It's fine. 
Okay. Um, so let's go. In a minute. Oh, okay. There we go. All right. So I wanted to, um, or we wanted to talk really quickly, like the briefest of overviews of like kind of the history of the frame, it's just kind of good to, to think about where it came from. So kind of pre-Renaissance, right? There was um, framing kind of as traditionally in altar pieces. So it's actually like sculptural, it's functional. It keeps it in a, a spot, right? Yeah, um, and yeah, I was just gonna say, so you're thinking about that in mm -hmm. around the 11th century. Mm -hmm. So altar pieces, the frame is part of the work and it's not necessarily attached to the wall. Yeah. It's like freestanding, right? Or, or within the architecture. And then kind of after post-Renaissance, it kind of moves off that structural um, kind of altarpiece and maybe moves into the home or into some other uh, spots. Yeah, so mm -hmm. in around the 15th century, we can think about frames as something that's considered attachable and detachable from a work and that's serving more of a functional purpose on the wall. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, so these are sort of some things that we'll think about like throughout this presentation. So um, like three big questions, right? What makes sense for the work? Um, and then what makes sense for the architecture, the space that it's going in? And then what is safe? And we'll talk a lot more about what is safe throughout the presentation. So definitely keep these in mind um, and we'll try to address them as we go, but feel free to ask us about any of these mm -hmm. as we go through. And so this is a good slide. I, I pulled this, um, it's kind of good to see how things end up you know, even when they're intended to not look dated at the time, they're very contemporary. They don't, they don't always age the best. So Annie can talk a little bit about yeah, this. Yeah. So this is um, an example from one of the Guggenheim's founding directors and curators of the Guggenheim Foundation. So Hilla Ribe. Um, and so this is a very specific style of framing, which she uh, thought that all non-objective art should be framed um, in this way to help with a spiritual experience. <laughs> and so she always chose to mount paintings in heavy, unadorned silver gilt frames that sloped toward the wall to create an organic exchange between the viewer, the picture, and the space. Um, so a really unique example, but you can see kind of the trends or like different ways of thinking about frames mm -hmm. uh, throughout time. Um, and then we have another another slide. Um, and then I pulled this one because I think it's really important to think that there or to understand that there are some works that are kind of intrinsically tied to their frame. Like I, we would never remove um, this from its frame because the frame is part of the work. It's kind of in this folk tradition um, and it's it's painted along with the picture. So that it's part of the work. And even though we kind of consider it a frame, you would never kind of remove the two things from each other. Um, Oh, go ahead. I was going to say just just to kind of, you know, give a sweeping statement. <laughs> Everything we're sharing is from our perspective at oh, yeah. Florida State at our Museum of Fine Arts, working with our curators and our space specifically. Um, and so just to kind of give you that it's it's you know, you depend on your curators, your space always. Um, we're about a mid sized museum with about five full time people working here. Yeah. Um, and so just kind of to give you a little bit of a sense of scale and yeah. some things we'll be talking about. Yeah, we'll hedge a lot on on certain slides uh, regarding kind of what what we do in our museum and how that may or may not translate elsewhere. Um, but so as far as like the, the very most general anatomy of kind of a framing, what I'll refer to from henceforth to as a sandwich. Um, and so you have your frame, right? So that's that outside, nothing in the middle. That's what holds that uh, all together. You have your glazing of, you know, a couple of different materials that we'll talk about. You have an optional window mat. So that is the thing that kind of frames the work, goes on top of the work and kind of, um, covers any like hanging stuff that or mounting tape, that sort of thing. Then you have your two-dimensional framed piece um, and then a backer board. So something that would just keep it rigid. And then you would have kind of an extra foam core filler board that would just add like a level of protection on the back of that work. Um, and then some framers will uh, use kind of some, some tape to kind of hide anything that's, you know, any of the hardware and stuff. Um, we don't do that. Uh, we'll talk more about masking tape later or why tapes might not be great, but. So before we move on from the basic mm -hmm. sandwich, do you have any questions? <laughs> Perfect. Nope. All right. Um, so talking about what we use in our museum, I just kind of started with that. So we have a, you know, our collection is, is pretty extensive. We have, what is it, about 7,000 objects? Almost. Just under, I think. 
And so a lot of them are stored in flat files. So a lot of our two dimensional artwork, we frame when we show it. Um, and so what we've kind of, our solution to that is that we've ordered um, a variety of sizes of these kind of really heavy duty aluminum welded corner frames that will just plop in our work. And so we kind of have, um, you know, we, they're the white of the kind of white wall museum, you know, that kind of cool white that doesn't look yellow. Um, and then we just kind of reuse them over and over again. And so um, talking a little bit, these are really nice if you're shipping work, say you're a photographer that needs to ship things because they're welded corners, they're really sturdy. Um, and so how that works is the metal part and you'll see in the bottom left, there's you know like some profiles. It's just like an L shape. And then what holds it in um, that glass, that sandwich, is something called a strainer. And so what you would do is you would screw through the edge of the frame into that wood strainer. And that's what the hanging hardware would sit on. Really secure, really stable, easy to use. And you can see the strainer on the right, mm -hmm. uh, that, that kind wood, of wooden piece wooden part. that has the hanging wire on it. Um, and these uh, frames that we use oh, that yeah. are this type are from Small Core. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just drop that name in the chat if anyone wants to check them out. And yeah. they're a little bit more on the expensive side. Yeah. So <laughs> if we're talking about price range, these are going to be on the higher end. Um, and again, this is only really for flat work. We can talk a little bit more about what you would do with paintings later on. Um, but yeah, these are really great for, for again, shipping work awesome because they hold up really well. And we'll actually have an example of one of our pieces framed yeah. in these later on so yeah. you get to see it. Um, and then so a step down from that, maybe something more accessible to like home use or uh, maybe like a, an artist starting out. Um, and actually some of our, our work in the permit collection is just kind of permanently framed in these. These are um, kind of a kit, a metal kit style. And so what you would do is you'd call up your framing shop and just be like, hey, I need um, this many lengths. So two, two sizes of this by this, right? And then they would send it to you. And basically how it works is there's kind of, you know, the, the small core has that L shape. These have kind of a U shape. And so they kind of hug that sandwich. And then there's hardware on the back that you attach the corners. These are not so great for shipping because those corners do, they can get banged up and loosened a little bit. Um, so we can go to the next slide, I think, or the, do you have something? Yeah, I was going to say, these are um, a cheaper option. Yeah. And like Kelly said, you're just getting these links <clears throat> of extruded metal. So you can kind of customize it to specific sizes. Yeah. And then I also want to say thank you, Norwood, for putting the small core link in the chat. I appreciate oh, that. awesome. Um, but yeah, as far as those go, they come in a million different profiles, though. So you can actually probably go to um, uh, Nielsen, Brainbridge Nielsen is a brand of these, um, but any frame shop will have like a, a bunch of different profiles. And when I say profile, I mean the shape of that U right there. Um, and so a wooden kit style, really similar to that metal kit style, um, except they don't come apart and go back together quite as easily. I mean, you could get them apart, but they're kind of made to like you assemble them and then you keep them assembled. Um, and then they're actually really similar to the uh, small core frames and that it's just an L. And so instead of a strainer, you'll use something called a point gun, which is basically just like a staple gun, but it sends out these tabs to the side. So that's what holds that sandwich in. And you can see the point <clears throat> gun on the left um, with an example, you know, yeah, right before little. the gun is a point that's been shot in. So if you've ever tried to remove these, um, just like at <laughs> home, like if you've ever gotten something from a garage sale, and it was pointed in. It's like the most frustrating thing because you don't have the right tools. As, yeah. Is that just me? I don't know. Uh, no, it's, it's annoying. Okay. <laughs> um, and then uh, float, there's also a floater frame. So this is really um, more common with uh, paintings. So an unglazed things. The floater frame doesn't have um, any sort of glazing typically. And so this, uh, the floater frame kind of sits, you, you build it so it's outside of that, that frame, that original canvas size. And so um, it's, and it's all attached to the back so that um, the stretcher bars typically. This, um, this is a really good way, like you'll often see, see where it, there's that arrow pointing that says frame. You'll see that is oftentimes a little bit deeper than the picture. So uh, say that the painting is like, you know, an inch, that floater frame might be an inch and a half. And that is just a, adding a little bit more protection for that canvas. Say if it's like leaned up against a wall or something, it'll be the frame that touches the wall, not the canvas. 
And so it does add a little bit um, of safety. And then you, you can also get really, really fancy with these, as you can see kind of down in the, the right, it was kind of popular in the like, you'll see some 70s, 80s paintings with like these kind of double or triple kind of framed things. And it, that also helps because there's, you, of course, you don't want to put glazing on a canvas oh, like yeah. this. Mm -hmm. um, so that extra little length can help protect. <clears throat> Um, and then there's a myriad of other things, right? Um, so if you have in your collection uh, some older paintings, you might have seen some of this like gilding stuff. That's actually a, oftentimes a combination of wood and uh, cast plaster with gold leaf on it. And so those can get kind of uh, fragile, but it's all cast stuff. Um, and then there's also hand carved wood like the top left here. Um, and you'll see that that bottom kind of left picture we have and that's what you'll see in like Michael's or whatever when you go to the framing they have all these different kind of ornate style frames um, and as far as that goes the one thing you want to think of is like molding does have to kind of match up especially if it has like any of these like filigree floral kind of curly q things so you really want to make sure that your your corners are, are set correctly yeah, that's as how as you that can goes. really tell if it's a, a cheap version of one of these is if <laughs> yeah. you look in the the join corners and mm -hmm. it's all you know, off and not uh, matching up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good framer will have that filigree go like uh, across the corner and it'll look really, really tight. Um, then as far as like uh, glazing goes, um, you can, there's a bunch of different options for this. Um, in the museum, whenever we can, we use glass. It's, it's my favorite because A, it's really durable. It doesn't scratch very easily. Um, and it's not reactive, right? There's, there's no off-gassing. There's no like bad plastic or bad types of glass that you can use. Um, plastic does have its advantages though. You can get all of these kind of crazy coatings, including UV coating. Um, and there's also uh, something called polycarbonate, which is like shatter resistance. It's super, super strong. So sometimes, you know, if you're shipping work that can have its benefit. Um, and then, but the thing that really matters is the size, right? So when I'm framing something like small, I can use um, like the cheap single plane, uh, sing single pane glass. That's easy, it's light, um, it's easy to cut and work with. Um, if I'm doing anything a little bit larger, I might wanna call my glass shop and get a little bit nicer glass, a little bit thicker. Um, it'll hold up a little bit more under the weight. Anything really large, you're pretty much looking at only plexiglass or some sort of acrylic um, because it's, glass is really heavy <laughs> if you've ever picked up a piece of glass you know um so the 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 thickness of the glass that you would need to to frame something really large would make it almost unmanageable um and so that those are those kind of uh parameters that you would you would have did you have anything to add? yeah i was just gonna say and with glass you know one of the limitations is you can't or you can but it's really hard to uv protect it mm -hmm. um so that's a strength of plexi yeah they have um, all sorts of fun stuff that they can throw in there <laughs> yeah and that polycarbonate won't shatter mm -hmm. so it's a good option yeah would you be able, yeah would you be able to expand a little bit on um been advised recently i'm framing 30 pieces as part of my capstone and mm -hmm. I'm going to go with museum plexi mm -hmm. uh, because they're 30 pieces and it, it, even though they're all small engravings, it'll reduce on the shipping. But I wanted to know if you could share some of the details about um, the color casts in plexi. The, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a plastic uh, engineer. <laughs> I don't know all of the, the details on that one. That would be more of, a, you know, I would call my glass shop and just ask. Right. But, well, um, well, I'd, I'd heard, you know, in round robin discussions, mm -hmm. that plexi could be more green and that huh. um, museum plexi doesn't, um, in addition to having a UV coating, it doesn't scratch as easily. Um, yeah. but, but I just started learning about all these little nuances. So I, I just had to ask. It was a nerdy question. Yeah. I mean, no, that's okay. I mean, the, the reason plexi does have um, I mean, it's advantages, right? Like it's it's durable, it's easy to ship. Sometimes you can get it for really cheap, but um, it is it does have like, you have to clean it with a microfiber cloth and all of these kind of persnickety little things because it does scratch really, really easily. Like if you use the cheap paper towels, like the ones from the university bathroom, those like brown, whatever, it will leave these like tiny, tiny little hairline scratches, which you have to, you know, so anytime you move it, it's like, it stresses me out storing plexiglass. <laughs> but yeah, well, it's, it's, it's the same with eyeglasses. You should never <laughs> use uh, paper, but I'll give you an inside skinny is um, yeah. 
baby diapers. Oh, baby diapers good. can be used to polish plexi and glass. Oh, that's um, so cool. And fiberglass without scratching. I wonder if they'll let us do baby diapers on our P card. <laughs> No, I, you know, I, I, I learned that from my eyeglasses doctor friend. That's so brilliant. Wow. Thank you for that. That's great. Good skill, good skill sharing both ways. Yeah. I love that. Um, any other glazing questions? Perfect. No? Okay. All right. So um, also here's more of our hedging, right? I'll talk a little bit more about um, our space and tools and what we have. Again, we're kind of like a a modest size museum. So we're not doing like huge production stuff. Like if I'm gonna frame like a show for one of our floors, it might be only about 30 to 40 pieces that we'll be framing. So it's not a huge volume that we're using, but we do have some really fun, bigger tools that I like. Um, so on the left, you'll see that's our, our wall mounted uh, mat cutter. And so uh, we call it, you know, it's the Fletcher 3000, which is like such a, a fun thing to say. The Fletcher 3000. <laughs> And so uh, it does three things really well. It'll cut a uh, mat board, foam core, um, and then it has uh, like a little rotating wheel in there. So it, you can also cut acrylic and glass, which is really nice. And yeah, so it's just very straight. It's, you know, That's easy. Is that manual or electric? Uh, manual. And then uh, on the right, you'll see this is just our like framers um, razor. And so Logan is the brand that makes all the kind of like niche framing tools or they're one of them i guess but this is um how we cut those windows and i'll talk a little bit more about mats uh in a minute but if you look at like a mat in you know framing mat it's almost always cut on a 45 degree angle and so this thing just is really easy to use it'll maintain that 45. you can do it i've done it in my studio they, they make little handheld ones and you like clamp down a ruler and you can kind of do it really carefully but this thing is like way easier um, and then this is our space. So, you know, anytime you're framing, you want a lot of like table area, you're moving like, you know, bigger things from here to there. So always count on like three times the amount of space as you would need for, <laughs> you know, to lay it out. Um, and so you'll see kind of our framers uh, knife there and then just some surface area. And then on the right, you'll see, these are our small core frames that we were talking about earlier. Um, they just kind of live on this rack while we're not using them. And just to brag on Kelly, she built our frame storage, <laughs> which I think is awesome. Um, and then here's more surface area, right? And then those flat files, I just have all of my materials in that or so it's like all really easily accessible. And you'll see like on the right, I have all my little corners ready to go and we'll talk about corners in a minute. All right, so another thing you wanna think about um, when you're framing stuff is uh, the work, right? So there's a term bleed, right? So this is, uh, refers to like kind of the printing style. So is it full bleed or is it not full bleed? Full bleed refers to uh, the image going all the way to the edge. So that's going to limit some different things that you can do, right? You want to show the full image. Um, if it does have a margin, it is not a full bleed and you can kind of do some different things with it. Mm -hmm. um, so Again, I talked a little bit about all of my corners that were set up on the side. Um, this is my favorite way to frame things, if I can. It's kind of limiting because it is kind of coming in to the picture, but if you have a border, it's great. You're not taping anything to the frame. It's really safe for the artwork. Um, just think of like your grandma's scrapbook, right? Her little picture corners. It's the exact same thing. So you would just have this little pocket for the corners to go in. And then everything else would kind of go on top of that. And it's a really safe way for that material to be in the frame. And on the left, it looks like pre-made corners mm -hmm. and then Kelly will fold. Yeah, I just use like, um, I'll cut strips of vellum and just fold my own corners, especially if I can use like a beefier one, like a, a thicker one, I will just to kind of, you know, distribute any weight that that paper will have. How much of the image do you lose? Well, we wouldn't be, I wouldn't do this if I would lose the image. I would only do this if there was like a, a border that I wouldn't necessarily need to be framed. Like this would, you would only use these when you're using a mat board that would hide the, the corners. Gotcha, thanks. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if anyone has a question about folding a corner, when we, we have a <laughs> yeah, activity, but, we can mm -hmm. show you if you, if you like, yeah. Um, and then so here we are at mats. Um, and so again, kind of like our frames, we kind of always have like a really, basic white, that kind of um, cool white color mat. Um, and we use at the museum floor ply, 
Um, again, we're kind of a moderately budgeted museum. You might go to like a nicer museum and they might have a really like attractive eight ply, which gives it a little bit more heft. It's really fancy looking. Um, but the mat kind of serves the purpose of keeping the artwork off of the glazing. Um, and so you never really want the artwork face touching anything, right? That's the ideal. And so the mat gives it that tiny little buffer. Uh, two ply, don't even mess with it. Uh, <laughs> spend the extra money, do, do four ply, it's, it's way nicer. Um, you can also get really kind of fun with it. You'll see in like, you know, maybe a family member's house or something, they have something, re a really fun color. Um, and so you can get all of these kind of a crazy color um you had something we're talking yeah. about you know when you get your degree framed oftentimes yeah. they'll do like a double color maybe your school colors or something mm -hmm. and have um have it be a little bit fancier oh yeah you can you can and you can double them up too so you can see in the top right it's, it looks like it's double matted so you'll oftentimes see like that color will be that kind of really tight small one um there's also I have like an old old framing book and they talk about how to paint that bevel edge so super exactly. But um, now I, I think this is like before they made like really nice mat board. You can get some with like different color cores in them. So when you cut it, it's kind of this little like um, colored reveal. We, I, I wouldn't do it for a museum show necessarily unless it like really had a reason, <laughs> but you know, it's fun to think about. Um, and then, so here's some of my math. I know this is kind of goofy, but we'll do more math later on. Don't worry. It's a lot of math in my job. Um, and so uh, this was one of our shows. We had, we framed all these Bruce Davidson images and our curator decided that some of them needed to be framed together. And of course they're like all different sizes. <laughs> and so this is just something to think about as far as like how you would lay things out. And, you know, ideally I go for, you know, you, you want to look at it and not go, oh, why did they do it this way? You know, that's like not the question I ever want anyone to ask. And so I have to kind of like figure out mathematically what looks the best and, you know, what works and what isn't questioned. And Kelly will be the first to tell you with our interns, they, all, <laughs> they get sessions with Kelly. And if there's framing to do, then they'll learn how to frame. And Kelly is an advocate. You have to draw a picture. Yeah. Otherwise you will be lost. Even if you think you won't be, you have to draw it out. And um, I have to say, it's very, very helpful. Yeah. I think we were just doing this and I was like, Annie, where's your picture? <laughs> but yeah, you have to have something to, to reference yourself. And like uh, we said, we'll go through an activity, but it's not going to be this complicated, no. but I think this is really helpful to see, mm -hmm. um, just to think about if you ever had to frame something that was a little bit more complex. Um, mm -hmm. And these are our standard frames that we have. Yeah, that's um, the small core On frame. the left, just so you know what they look like. Um, and so here's like when you wouldn't use corners. So say it's a full bleed print, right? I wouldn't want that image to be lost at all. That's like bad, bad news. Um, and so you can, there's something called a hinge, which is you're actually, um, at this point, you're, you're taping things to the back of the work um, with a really specific tape, of course. But um, there's two different kinds of hinges. There's a T hinge and a V hinge. Um, and so the V hinge just refers to, say this is the work, the V hinge, or actually I have a picture, why am I doing it with my hands, uh, on, the, on the left. So you'll see that kind of gets hidden behind the work. So it's like, you know, you wouldn't even really need to, to put a mat on top of it at all. Um, it's all hidden, all of your work is behind the scenes, right? Um, and then the T hinge on the right, that's just um, just a, a flat, you would like kind of tape it to the backer board and you might be um, putting a mat over this, but it would be really tight. So, so tight that you couldn't put a corner in there. It would look weird. And so that just kind of, it holds that, that paper to the backboard. And like Kelly said, the V, you know, we're, we're thinking about having adhesive on the work with mm -hmm. these and these hinges. And so we'll talk a little bit about, um, what's archival and what's not towards yeah. the end. And we have a question. Yeah. What's that special tape called? Oh, I can, I can go grab, we're really close to our framing room. So like when we get to the activity, I'll, I'll go grab it and I'll show it to you. <laughs> Great question. But Gaylord sound, sells it. Gaylord has all these like lovely archival things. Um, and then, so kind of similar, right? Um, we have something called float mounted. And so float mounted is when you really want to accentuate that edge of the piece, right? So say, you know, you could still actually, can you go back one? Mm -hmm. So you've gone to, you know, you've got your um, V hinge, right? You could just, sh you know, put glass in the frame and you could show it like that just on top of the board and then go forward. 
but this one, if you really wanted to like have, you know, that shadow or accentuate the edge for some reason, um, you would want to float mount it. And so that you would use those hinges, but you would then um, actually Lanco might might be the one. But um, I'll, I'll go grab it in a minute. I'm not a brand person. In the chat for the team. Yeah, oh. sorry. There you go. That's the one I have, <laughs> the uh, the screen. But um, as far as like the float mounted, it's uh, you're just adding a little bit of like foam core or something behind it. So you're mounting it with those hinges to um, like a little bit of a spacer. And then you'll see in that top um, picture, there's a spacer that keeps that glazing off of the work. So you're kind of, it almost looks like it's suspended in the middle of the frame. It's very cool. And um, something that Kelly mentioned when she was explaining this to me <laughs> is that it's the foam core or whatever you're using is almost like a table. Mm -hmm. And your work yeah. is just like <laughs> floating over the table. Which yeah, the foam core would be, would be like smaller than the work. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to see the foam core at all. I love the shadows that it makes too. Yeah. Um, and so you'll see here, these, these are different ways to hang your work on the wall, which we'll talk about also. Um, but as far as those kit style frames, they come with their own D rings. And so when I say D ring, that's like anything that is shaped like a D. So you'll like screw it in here and then it'll be D shape. Um, and then, so they kind of come with their own little recessed uh, things that you can hang from. But there's a million different, uh, for good and bad, right? There's a million different ways you can hang things from the wall. I really do prefer D-rings when you can use them. Um, any of these things, actually, can you see Annie's cursor? Yeah, okay, yeah. great. So any of the things like this or like, like this guy, those are kind of a little cheesy and I don't know what they're weight rated at and you know they could shift or fall off. I would not trust those nearly as much as I would a D-ring. Um, D-rings can take a lot of weight. Um, that said, when you're hanging with a wire, um, you, there's something called a lark's head knot. Um, so you'll see often, especially when you like buy something from a thrift store, it's just like a little loop and then they've twisted it around. If you were to hang that, if it had any sort of weight at all, even if it didn't, it would start to sag. It's not so safe. Um, the Lark's head knot is, is kind of like a slip knot. And so like the way you do it, you can find a YouTube tutorial for it, but that's a really safe knot. It's not going to slip. It's going to be really secure. Would you have a, a, a source for your hardware? Um, I mean, I think the last time I bought them, I just bought like, you know, 50 pound D rings from like Amazon or something. I, I don't have a great source. No, we have like some uh, restrictions on our vendors. So. Yeah, we're, we're really limited. Um, but as far as uh, hanging things now we're we're on to here, right? We're thinking about the wall now. Um, so when we hang things in the museum, our curator, like our team has kind of decided that a 58 or 60 inch center is really comfortable for most of our viewers, you know? Um, and so when I say like that, you know, 58 center, that means that the picture itself, the middle of the picture is hanging at 58, not the top, not the bottom, the center, right? So that that's kind of, you're not creaning your neck basically for that. But Annie has some like other, other things to talk about as far as hanging height. Yeah, so just so something that I thought I would pop in here, you know, when we think about like a normal height or anything that's that we do all the time in museums, I think it's always important to kind of question that, right? And so there really is no normal to hang at. Um, so I wanted to share a couple examples. I really like Amanda Caccia's work. Um, and so she had a show that she put together a few years ago. She's a huge scholar in the field of accessibility. If you want to check out her work, she has an awesome website. Um, I went to a talk of hers and she was talking about this show, com uh, Composing Dwarfism, Reframing Short Stature in Contemporary Photography. Uh, and they kind of pushed back on that normal height and hung everything in consideration of people who experience dwarfism. Um, so just something to think about. And on the bottom, I've also included a, a photo that's just from, you know, from the MoMA. But if you're doing a show that's primarily for your, a younger audience, uh, you might want to think about having some things hung at various levels so they can experience it in the same way. Um, you know, just something to think about. I'm not an expert in that, but, you know, lots to, to think about. And like I said, there is no normal. Um, and so we'll do kind of an exercise on this 
at the end, but. Oh, and just, oh, a, Andy has a question in the chat too. Oh, yeah. So oh, what does everyone here hang at? Oh, yeah. I've always done 60, but we're thinking of lowering it. So if anyone has a different hanging height, throw that in the chat. Yeah. I I did 60 up until I got to this museum and, um, uh, our, our curator, I think prefers 58. She, I, I don't know if she's just being a rebel or what, but, <laughs> um, so as far as measuring, um, you kind of, you know, to hang at that center, right. You have to do a little bit of math. So you have to kind of figure out the height of the frame and then like adjust for the wire. And then you hang at that and we'll do that later all together. You're going to get to do it. Yay. Yeah. With a tiny ruler and <laughs> a tiny piece of paper. Um, and so a note on spacing and scale. Um, and so this wall, like I just wanted to you to think about maybe you work with a database often. It's kind of hard to like transfer the database to the wall, right? Um, so this wall right here is like a little over 14 feet. The prints, so the database measurement, right, would be 14 by 22. In the in these frames, they are now 22 by 28. Um, and there's like one wall label, which we consolidated, right? So you think about the spacing and they're pretty tight. Like it looks pretty crowded, but like looking at the database, you'd be like, oh, four pictures that are 14 by 22. Oh, they can go on a 14 foot wall easy, you know? So it's just something to think about. And just a little bit more in the chat, we oh, have yeah. a 60. 57. 57. Rebels. Eyeball it. <laughs> Understandable. Eyeball um, it. I don't know about that. That's what I would do at home. <laughs> I'd eyeball it. At home, I think that's fine. Um, so this is yeah. an example of a work from a show we hosted in the fall uh, called A Shared Body. And we worked with this really amazing artist, Sarah Sense, to mm -hmm. create these original works uh, titled Mississippi and Meshoshepi. Um, So we came into a few interesting um, situations <laughs> in consideration of this work and framing. Yeah. Well, first I'll talk about hanging it. So you'll notice uh, well, maybe you won't notice, but they're not hung at a 58, 60 inch center, right? These are, um, I think these are about six foot tall, um, maybe not quite that tall, but, but very tall, right? If we hung them at a 58 inch center, they wouldn't even fit in our space. They would, you would like be craning your neck to look at the very top. Um, and so these we actually did by, by feel, right? Um, you know, a couple of us held them up and our curator was like, yes, that feels right. It's not, it's, it's a very comfortable height, but we kind of did it more off the floor. So at that, that center, center dimension, right? It really only works for kind of like small to, to medium sky, scale work. Um, but yeah, as far as uh, running into issues with this, so this, this was a, a show that was kind of curated pre-COVID, moved through COVID, and then we, they shipped everything out. During I guess COVID. during COVID, yeah. yeah. Um, so they're really <laughs> fragile weavings. Um, mm -hmm. And so they were coming from California to and Florida. to Florida. <laughs> and of course, if you think about in COVID, um, there was so much plexi that was being used to create barriers and to protect people in retail spaces um, that the artist actually was unable to source plexi in California. Uh, mm -hmm. for these works yeah um, and so we were able to Kelly called her contact at our framing shop and they had it in stock mm -hmm. so she actually sent these um, it's really hard to see but they're actually only mounted to the board with tape yeah so they're really really fragile um, the artist has been actually built the frames mm -hmm. and so they sent it and Kelly actually framed them here on site as we installed them um, which yeah, it was, was it was like a COVID hurdle that we you know she couldn't get plexi in California and so she really didn't want to send them flat but we just had to like be like no we promise we're going to take really good care of it we'll frame it really well I think she was really happy so that's all good yeah so they came in this huge crate um, un unframed but um, I just think that that's you never know what hurdles you're gonna yeah. you know come to especially mm -hmm. when you're thinking about shipping weight considerations um materials hopefully you know oh, actually there's um another thing about plexi is that it's staticky um with these we we did have to kind of account for that because we needed to leave a, a little bit of you know a little bit more space than we might normally um because all of I, you can't really see again in these but all of those are, are little strips of paper that are kind of adhered mostly at the top and sometimes you know if they're diagonal on the side but yeah oftentimes if if you're using plexi it'll cling to things um so you have to be kind of careful with that too make your spacer mm -hmm. but yeah glass again just another <laughs> example of the adaptability that we all had during covid <laughs> as emps um oh yeah another another picture from that same show um you can also frame a tv 
Um, and so like we wanted this this piece to kind of uh, read as as an artwork. We didn't want you to kind of come around the corner and look at that that hanging that space, the right? The profile of the yeah. TV, like right when you enter. And so we kind of came came to this conclusion. So, you know, framing can kind of take on other things. They're actually, Samsung is actually making a TV that looks like a piece of artwork now. I don't know if it's like for museums, <laughs> uh, but probably more just, you know, not be ugly at home. But uh, yeah, as far as framing, um, you can, you can once you kind of know how that L shape works, you can kind of frame anything. Oh, I see. I missed oh, the question. More. What height does uh, everyone hang labels at? Ooh, that, for me, I mean, we, I, it kind of depends on the show, but uh, we have we have like a stick that we use to so everything can get even. I know it's it seems it's like a cheat sheet, <laughs> super analog. It's a piece. It's a stick with a piece of tape on it, and that's how we keep everything the same. <laughs> I see labels depends. Usually, if yeah, talk if you're out of it, you should. Just... It's nice to hear from other people what they're know, doing right? at their institution. Labels are a big thing. Um, all right. Anyway, so we, we've talked a little bit about what's safe, right, um, throughout the presentation, what's safe for the artwork. Um, and I am not a chemist. I am not our um, collections manager. Um, so if I ever have any questions about anything, I usually go to her, her first. <laughs> but um, as far as what is archival, right, we talked about, there you go, that's the tape, line, line co, we were talking about it. Um, but what is, what is safe? Thinking about, I think the best way to describe it is you know when you open like a flat pack furniture like Ikea or something and you smell that kind of plasticky off-gassing? That is something that is uh, not safe. That is usually an acid or off-gassing environment. So you wouldn't want to put um, an artwork in that, right? And so there are materials that you can buy that are uh, that off-gas. And so anything archival would not have those sorts of things in it, right? Um, and so uh, the foam core that you buy, you want to make sure it's acid free, that it's archival, any sort of interleaving. So when you're stacking things, um, anything you put in between those pictures, you want that to be archival, the tapes, the glues, anything you use in that kind of sandwich, right, or, or in your collection, you need it to have like really special considerations. I got a question. Are you using pressure sensitive hinging tape or still on gum? We're, we're using, we're using um, pressure sensitive. So it, it does, I mean, it, I like that better. It's a little bit easier, um, but I mean, we can use the other one, but that's just the one that we use because it's easy. All right. Um, but as far as what isn't archival, right? There's a lot of those materials um, that, that smell. <laughs> um, and so that, you know, you can't just use any foam core, right? That foam core that you buy at the store is not not good for it. Those glues, there's a whole bunch that you would never use. And then um, probably anyone knows that masking tape. Like if you use, you see it on old masking tape, it's got that yellow. It's like all gummy and weird, not safe, right? And then cardboard actually surprisingly is stable for a very long period of time, but we just don't use it because it attracts bugs for the, the big reason. Um, and so this is the bad, bad stuff, right? So this is what we're trying to avoid. And so anytime there's a, an unsuitable environment, um, there's a, something called foxing. And so those, it might look like mold, but it's actually just the, the environment and that is affecting that paper. Um, and it's like, it can be caused by, by any of those things that you can kind of smell off the Ikea furniture, right? Um, but I'll say this humidity is, is the biggest cause. So any, your collection manager probably has like, a million different humidity sensors in your permanent collection that they're always monitoring or um, they'll they'll have dehumidifiers running all the time and that sort of thing because humidity is like the biggest culprit of anything bad. And in, in Florida we're very um, oh yeah <laughs> we experience humidity regularly. Um, any questions at this point before we go into our activity? No. Um, before we do oh I actually have a question um so this is sort of more general than specific um but obviously you guys have a lot of experience and knowledge um but if you ever are working on a project or an exhibition and you're not sure how to frame or hang something um what resources do you use to help solve your problems i mean i love the internet and we we have some resources our next slide is actually really great but um as far as uh resources uh, we're really lucky on staff our curator studied um archival bookbinding 
Um, and so if I have kind of a, a really specific kind of question that I think would, would have a book binding answer, I go to her. And then we have um, our, our collections manager who is really knowledgeable on all that stuff. Um, but I mean, it's the day of the internet, like YouTube and, and the internet is really like, as long as you're like spreading out your sources and getting it from a couple of different things, you're like, oh, okay, great. Um, but if, yeah, if you don't have someone on staff, I would say do a lot of research, but if you want to go one more slide. I was just going to say really quickly too, yeah. I know like if you're on like specific listservs, yeah. like for example, we're on, um, for, you know, academic museums and galleries, we're mm -hmm. on their listserv and oftentimes people stuff. will out, you know, outsource questions and kind of, or excuse me, crowdsource questions, um, and see what other institutions are using. Um, so I think that that's also a really great way if you don't have anyone who mm -hmm. you can talk to. Um, but like Kelly said, any of the, the chemistry, yeah, any of the chemistry stuff, there's like, you know, they're a bigger museum. They have, they, you know, they, they do something called an Audi test, which is like how much, you know, off gassing paint does over a period of times or, and that kind of thing. And so we, you know, we don't have those, those sorts of concerns here because we're not, we're not building cases that are going to hold things for a really long time, but any of those museums will have that stuff. And I think a lot of times they're, they're on those forums, they're on the chat. Um, and then if you go one yep. more, we have a speaking couple of resources. Forums, <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll get through these and then we can talk more about questions, but, um, we first we got International Mount Makers Forum. They're great. They're a great resource. They do um, uh, conferences, oh, um, but they're also. Do we have a refuse you line? What's that? We oh, is that you got one? Yay! Yeah, okay, yeah. you know. Um, but so International Mount Makers is going to be at the Getty, so don't be left out. Keep following yeah. the website on Instagram. I think right? Kelly's going to try to go. Yeah, I, I'd like to. Um, we'll see. And then oh, oh sorry. What? And then, um, so, but they're also a really great source of like museum nerdy memes. Um, so feel free to, to follow them on the Instagram. Um, and then Art Handler Mag, another really great source of fun memes and tips and tricks. Like I've learned a lot from Art Handler Mag, um, but they've done some really great work as far as like unionizing um, a bunch of galleries in New York and some museums. Um, they also did a really great survey of um, art workers during COVID about how it affected us. Um, and then refuse Uline, if you're at all familiar with uh, Ulinian politics, they're um, yeah, a bit much. Yeah, we love yeah. that. And so um, if you're looking for alternatives, they give you a whole bunch of other resources that you can buy all of these really specific materials from. And so they're great. I really like them. Yeah, great. Oh, thank you for dropping that in the chat. Yeah. Um, and so just a few things to think about. Sometimes it's really nice to see um, a meme that's perfectly curated to your experience in the museum. Um, and so we're big uh, proponents of that for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wait, we, we, we kind of skipped it. Were there more, more questions? questions? Yeah. yeah, no rush. Oh, we're doing on time, did I? We're good. Oh, we're good, okay. That's it. All right. Cool. Should we do some um, math? Does everyone have their activity sheets and their scissors? We're going to try and switch our camera so you can see my hands. Okay. Let's see if it works. You might have to go to the thing. Mm -hmm. Right there. Perfect. Bam. There we go. Okay. We did it. Um, okay. So we've got these sheets. Oh, no. Is it going to? Is it flipped? It's gonna be fine. You guys are gonna follow along just just great. I'm it is it is a little fuzzy though. I don't know. Do you think you guys will be able to follow along? Just like thumbs up, yes. I no, think so this looks this looks good. All right, cool. Because I don't know how to fix it. <laughs> um oh yeah, and we'll show you how to do corners too. So you'll need one gallery wall. You'll if if everyone has scissors, go ahead and cut out your uh, ruler and like choose an artwork. Oh, you already did it. You beat me. And um, if you feel free to be chatty at this point, I know this is like watching me cut out a miniature ruler is not the most exciting thing in the world. I'll take this moment to point out. I don't know if some of you saw. Some of my coworkers have been poking their head in because they were like what are that sounds so cool what are you talking about that's more interesting than my work right now oh that's so funny but thank you both for this great presentation oh yeah no problem this is great 
it's the age of Zoom. We can all do so much and share so many things. It's great. Yeah, and speaking of sharing, I'm seeing um, a lot of folks have been um, adding like questions, but also like oh. resources and links in the chat. So like, yeah, that's fabulous. Keep filling it in. That's perfect. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. And then, and you can also um, draw an artwork if you like. Yeah, we, we left them blank for a reason. So if you want to get really nerdy with it. Fantastic idea. All right. So let's first, here, I'll see if, oh, look, okay, it is upside down. All right. We'll see if I can do my math upside down. Do you want to just roll your chair around? I could just roll my chair around. That'll probably be easier. All right. So as far as like this uh, 58, 60, what, let's do a 60 inch. That's what everyone kind of said that they were doing, right? So the math, right? So we're gonna do the height of our picture. So we need that height. So you take- And just so you know, we're upside down. So follow along in the sheet, but just ask me if you want us to slow down. Yeah. So we're gonna measure the height. And so mine, we're gonna say 30. 35, right? So 35 or whatever yours is, if you chose a different yeah, frame. Yeah, my, yours is probably not 35, especially if you like, you, you know, you can hang it like this, right? Oh, I forgot. We had, First step, you have to draw our picture wire. So turn your thing upside down. And so what you'll do is we're going to draw, we're going to draw this wire right here. So you're going to be like, oh, there's my wire right there. That's where I want my nail. Is there a particular distance we should be thinking about to draw? Our not work? at all, because, you know, you might not have been the person that frames this, so mm. you got to think about it. It can be, you know, and I'll say this, this is another opportunity. Typically, you would hang your D-rings about a third down your picture, but you can, you can hang them however you want for the, the purposes of this exercise. So I've measured the height. It is 35, right? I'm going to um, divide that. Where's my math? Oh, okay. So I'm going to divide H in half, right? So that's my height, uh, my H, 35 divided by two. So I'm at 17.5. And then I want to subtract W. So W right here, that distance from the wire. So we'll measure that, right? So the top, top of our wire to the top of our frame, minus five inches. So I'm going to say minus five equals, so I'm at 12 and a half, right? So we've accounted for the wire. And so now we add uh, 60 inches, right? That's our, our center. So we'll do plus 60 equals 72.5. So I'm going to hang this. I'm going to find the middle of your wall. I could find the middle of my wall first. Yeah, let's do that. So the middle of my wall. I mean, this is if we're hanging one, right? If we're hanging multiple, it's a little bit more complicated. So actually, you guys, we all have the same wall. What's what's the width of our wall? Someone yell it out. Oh. I know the answer, but who else knows the answer? <laughs> is everyone getting 102? Yeah. Yes. All right, perfect. So what's 102 divided by two? right? If we're going to find the middle. 51. 51, right? So we'll kind of go 51, right? So now what we're going to do is we're going to, at this kind of center, we're going to measure up. And I'm realizing now my ruler is kind of upside down. It might have been easier if I did it the other way. Uh, we're going to measure 72 and a half. So if this could not be any easier so there's that's where our nail hole goes and so we would take this and just to check it this is how you can check your work yeah so we'll you know eh, we'll pretend like that's there you go i got the wire and so to check your work right we're gonna look at about the middle and we're gonna take our ruler and go okay is it 60 oh yeah there's 60 there's my center Bam, we did it. <laughs> Any questions about this or anything you want Kelly to go over? There's also pages in that packet. You'll see the pages of math. And so the thing that we're not going to do is the really crazy complicated one. I can share it There's... if you want. Give me a screen. Oh, yeah. Do you have it? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, let me screen share really quick. All right, she'll do it. Because we can just talk about it. You know, like that wall that um, I had those multiple um, uh, Bruce Davidson images on. I keep scrolling. Sorry, yeah, I, I think it's the last one. Oh, this mouse is being slow. Yeah, my, P my PDF thing goes like this sometimes. Ah, too far. See, this is why I like preview. <laughs> no, no, no. One more. Oh, it's, all, it's the last one. Okay. It's the one with the sideways dimensions. It's haunted. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So when you're thinking about, now we know how to do, whoa, it is haunted. <laughs> all right. There you go. Can you? Yes. So this is. Yeah. So we've, we've figured out the height, right? Um, and so at this one, you would want to mathematically kind of center your grouping of images on the wall. And so I, I kind of wrote it down just as a resource for you guys. Um, you can feel free to go crazy and take your gallery wall and cut out multiple pieces. All of the math is pretty solid. I've kind of like tried to label everything with letters so you can correlate and plug in the numbers. Um, but yeah, again, this is your picture. I drew it for you, right? And so Kelly, just to talk a little bit before we kind of wrap up our activity, sure. what are some additional considerations you have when you're hanging multiple works? Oh, well, we have, you know, in the museum, we have like some really long walls. And what we'll do oftentimes is um, when we'll group some, maybe like when that Bruce Davidson show that I keep oh. referencing. Can y'all not see what I or shared or can you see it? Uh, we can see the instructions from the work. Okay, yeah, perfect. Just to make sure. Okay. Um, but as far as like our long walls, we would do groupings. And so when I'm kind of measuring out, I kind of treat the groupings as one image and that's nice. And I'm, I make sure that's really clear with the distance between them. Um, also another thing, I think I wrote it down in the notes section of this, but you never kind of start at one end of the wall and work over to the other end. I did this once and I will never do it again because once you're off a little bit, the other end, it is gonna look really screwed, uh, 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 skewed towards the other side, right? All of those kind of missteps uh, compound. And so by the time you get to like the other side of your 40 foot wall or whatever, it's gonna be like way off. Um, and so what I'll usually do is I, I try and start from the center and kind of work out or work in like groups and do a lot of measuring off of other things. So if I can measure, you know, the center of A to the center of C, in this, just to check my my math, I will do that. Um, so yeah, lots of guessing or lots of lots of checking and not guessing. And then another question is um, when we're looking at E and D, mm -hmm. E is much larger than D. Uh -huh. So some thoughts on determining your E <laughs> versus your D. When when I'm having conversations with our curator, usually we're talking about measurement D because um, she'll be like, "Well, we'll put you know we lean up the show, we put kind of everything out." Um, on the floor and I'll be like, okay, well, what feels comfortable for these to be, uh, you know, what's the distance? And so we'll kind of get a grouping and we'll decide on, you know, whatever 10 inches or something. And then E is the kind of consequence of that, right? E is what, what ends up being the leftover. Or again, that long wall, if we're grouping things, I, um, I can kind of do some preliminary math and tell her it's like, okay, nothing can be, you know, if we want a good, you know, 20 inches between these groupings, these groupings can be between five to 10 inches, like apart, you know, these, these, uh, the, the pictures themselves. And so she'll be like, oh no, they need to be like tighter than that. Or they need, you know, oh, we have to figure something out. I have to move some things to a different wall, that sort of thing. So it's a lot of conversations with the curator. And then um, really quick, just before we get off of our fancy Camera, do you want to show oh, yeah. a corner fold? So yeah, here's our, and this is like a fun, um, so here's one of my, my corners that I have. Um, and this is just, you know, this is our tape, but it's so easy. So you take this strip and then you kind of fold it in this way and then you press it. So I'll do it again, take it out. So my fingers are top and then your, your fingers like kind of go like this. So it's like a little hat. So then do you use like a linen tape or? or yeah, or? yeah, I have a really, and this is like a really, you know, you don't have to worry too much about the, um, you know, this is, I would never put this like sticky stuff on the, the print itself, but it hold, holds the other one really great. Doesn't off gas. I love this tape. Are you using vellum for paper? 
or glass yeah. scene? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, glass scene kind of reacts sometimes to, to pictures. So um, if we're using prints sometimes, and I only have glass scene, I'll use glass scene, but vellum is my, my preference. Yeah, it's just not reactive. Any other questions about corners before we switch our camera? How are you getting a right angle? Ooh, so here's the thing. It's always going to be a right angle. That's so as long as these two bits meet, like I can even, I'll show you, I can even skew it so that, oh God, now it doesn't want to do it. I can even like skew it. So it's my two ends are not the same and it'll still be a right angle. That's just, I don't know. There's, there's like math and physics involved that I don't quite understand, but it's always a right angle. <laughs> All right, we'll switch it back over. Okay. Hey, we're back. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick shout out for Kelly who painstakingly developed this <laughs> mini wall. Um, but I really wanted her to include the option for you to practice at home and do mm -hmm. multiple works. And um, our PDF, feel free to use it if you're working yeah. with interns or if you need to train someone. Um, we hope that it's helpful and, you know, let us know if you like it and, and we'd love to, to hear how it's going. Yeah. Um, we developed it for the, the workshop, but I think this is going to be like an intern project for like every semester. Yeah. Um, uh, um, sorry. Oh, no, um, go ahead. Okay. Um, there are a couple of things when I was looking at your hang, I didn't see a picture wire. And so I'm guessing, are you all hanging on hooks? And one of the reasons I asked this is, and you have an example, but y'all hung it vertically. Yeah. So I've, I've got these long, yeah. narrow things, right? Yeah. So I use a, it's not a sawtooth bar, but I use a flat bar at the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there a way, because I, I, I surrendered this for someone else to do the install. They said, well, we, we want wire. And I was like, well, if you feel strongly about it, uh, but they fall forward. But, yeah. You know, I, 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 I'm assuming it turned out really well. Um, but do you have any tricks mm -hmm. for um, if you're hanging on a wire, you know, when I say a wire, if you've got a picture or, or yeah. um, some kind of uh, system, yeah. how do you keep the work from tilting? So I'll, sh I'll kind of um, show here. So say, do you want our, up no, it's fine. Uh, so say this is our picture, right? What oftentimes you'll see with a big thing is you'll get two D rings, one here and one here, and you'll actually hang off the D rings. So the math is the same, but the tool that I use is I have um, a, a level that has the, I, I forget what it's called when it has the zero in the middle and it measures out. Level? No, no, it's got like, um, it's not like a one to 20. It's like a zero in the middle and then it goes 10 to each side or whatever. There's a there's a name for that tool. I forget what it is. Is that a center, center finding rule? Yes, I guess that's probably what it is. Um, but I thought it was a com more complicated name. But anyway, I have a level that is a center finding ruler on it. And so what I'll do is I'll do my, my nail hole the same, but then I'll go out and I'll, you know, I'll have it as at the level and I'll be able to measure out between those two D rings. And so that's where I would hang my two hooks. So then you just beg them not to use wire and have them trust you. Yeah, or you could like buy them a really nice center finding level ruler. Yeah, they, 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 I had, I had uh, the D rings on the side and then, um, you know, toothless slats yeah. right at the top frame at the back. Cause you can, you know, when they're small, if you just hang them from the top, you know, they won't tell, but they're well, like, no, we must have wire. I, so I'll tell you about that. I, did I miss that part? We had talked about it before, but I don't like hanging things from the top of anything. Is that what you're talking about? Oh, you were talking about, you had it like the little things yeah, that- just because the, the floaters that I've got, these are so lightweight and it's not yeah. a big, I, I have no glass. I, I have nothing yeah. that's going to separate the corners. Yeah, but that is a that is a good point. Like traditionally, I would never want to hang something yeah, from no. that top bar, you right, know, right. like because then it would sag. I think I, I don't want to be a bad influence on y'all. That's just a little thing that saves me headache. Yeah, 
but yeah, so if you distribute the weight out between the two sides, it kind of pulls it tighter together and you're like hugging your sandwich instead of pulling away from your sandwich. Think about it that way. Yeah, I just had a problem trying to convince them not to use wire because of yeah. the- just do the, just have them hang it on the two D rings on the sides and they'll, they should be able to do that. I hope. Um, and just to, if anyone wants to keep up with us or we love museum people and that's mm -hmm. why we wanted to do this uh, Skillshare, just going to put our Insta handles in the chat. Feel free to reach out. Let us know how the worksheet's going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Um, or send me all your math questions. Or you know, if you <laughs> hang something, we'd love to support you in that. Um, yeah. And so I think that's that's it for yeah. for hanging. And thank you so much. We really enjoyed it. Thank you two so much. That was fabulous. Oh my gosh, we had little tiny adorable like frames, <laughs> a wonderful activity. I have not enjoyed math so much in a very long time. So thank you yeah. so much. Um, before we, we wrap up everyone, I just want to quickly say um, thank you all for being here and for um, you know, your participation makes Skillshare possible. Uh, I encourage you to keep an eye out for next month's uh, Skillshare, which we'll announce on Mighty Network soon. And Mighty Network, by, by the way, is our platform for the NEMPN community. It's a, a great place to, to see what we're doing, but also to like continue these kinds of conversations. So I really encourage everyone to, um, to join and connect with colleagues. Um, and let's see, in the meantime, uh, before our next Skillshare, you can check out the Skillshare playlist on the NEMPN YouTube page. Um, we've just added last month's resume writing Skillshare video, and this um, recording will also go on to that um, playlist. So I'm just going to add that to the chat for anyone who wants to refer back to this video. Um, and lastly, if you're interested in leading your own Skillshare presentation, or if you know someone who think um, would be a great presenter, you can submit your idea on uh, the Google form we have set up. That's actually how I was able to, to connect with Annie and Kelly, which I was so fortunate uh, to do. Um, and yeah, feel free to forward the link to anyone you think might have a good idea for a presentation. All right, well, thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you again, Annie and Kelly, for that fabulous presentation. I've learned so much and I'm so excited to go home and uh, start drilling more holes in my wall, but in a more purposeful way and with beautiful framed, you know, frames around things before I put them up. So thank you both. I will have to do a second Skillshare on patching holes. <laughs> oh, okay, I, that, that thought crossed my mind. I'm glad you said it because uh, yeah. your girl needs that. All Thanks, right. Everybody. Bye, everyone. See you next time. Thank you. Bye.